Great. Thanks, Rocco, and, and thanks everybody for, for joining. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to have the uh, ability to present today. Um, uh, I'm Matt. I'm the CEO of Ono. Um, we're a technology solutions company that's based in Kenya in the U.S. And um, we, we, we focus a lot on building kind of digital health platforms to help support organizations like WHO, UNICEF, and Ministries of Health to, to implement, you know, uh, digital health solutions uh, to help address global health challenges. Um, um, and I just want to quickly mention, I'm joined today by some of our team. We have Francis, who's the uh, our kind of technical product manager, and he's one of the leads on the work we're doing. Um, so a lot of the stuff I'm showing is a result of, of his hard work. I just get to kind of take the credit a little bit. Um, so, yeah, so today I'm going to uh, try and walk through a little bit um, our journey around uh, developing applications uh, that are uh, based in FIRE, but the idea of um, allowing us to support um, WHO smart guidelines, um, so be able to ingest and use those as the foundation for we think is to be a, a next generation of, of digital health apps. I just want to walk through a couple slides to present sort of the context and then we'll do a very very brief demo just to show you where we're at um, in terms of making this a real um, product um, so we've been in the kind of digital health space um, for about a decade um, and have in you know building both applications for uh, community health workers but also for facilities and i think we we kind of cut our teeth on kind of the facility side more. Um, so we kind of were exposed to building out, um, when you start to start to develop facility apps, you start to realize quite quickly how complex they can become. Um, uh, so, you know, we developed first with with PATH and with with Gates and Ministry of Health in Zambia, um, Zero, which is a EIR, Electric Immunization Registry app um, that we rolled out in Zambia with the government. Um, but then after that, we uh, worked with WHO to develop their first um, um, kind of uh, reference application based on their new ANC guidelines. Um, and to be honest, like was a, I think a, a, it was about a one and a half year process just to kind of get all that logic from the PDFs um, to um, kind of a digital format, like in, into the OpenSRP kind of way we, we build our apps, um, a ton of back and forth with WHO and um, you know, we got it. We got it built, and it's launched, and we're, we're it's being deployed in a couple of countries right now. But I kind of like to think that that pain and that experience and uh, the, the difficulty in representing that clinical logic in a way that's reproducible um, helped in inspire a little bit the the idea of the WHO smart guidelines. Um, so working with kind of closely with WHO, you know, um, you know, WHO had this vision around saying, hey, we. Um, you know, historically, our, our our role is to develop kind of guidelines that provide uh, kind of the clinical guidance for what ministries of health should do when they're implementing something like ANC or, or child immunization. Um, now, as we start to work in the digital world, the challenge is how do we start to take these guidelines and make sure that they're converted over in a in a in a quick way, in a in a in a, in a timely way without a lot of error. And it's something that's not too expensive, but also importantly, you know, WHO is in the business of generating evidence. So there's a lot of interest in in wondering how could we develop digital health applications that, you know, first of all, have logic that we we know is accurate, is based on what we our recommendations are. But second, how could we ensure that um, the outputs are generating evidence, so standardized data, in a way that we can then use to uh, improve. Um, our guidelines, and then even in the future, potentially make dynamic guidelines uh, that would support this idea of precision health, public health. So using you know machine learning, AI. So you know adapting, for example, what a low birth weight or a low weight woman would be for like a high risk pregnancy. You know that might vary by country. So be able to kind of dynamically tune that for your 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 audience or the the clients you're serving. I think would be really really valuable. Um, so WHO came out with this, I think it's a groundbreaking idea around um, smart guidelines. Uh, and the vision was if we can make um, the these guidelines kind of computable, we call these L3 or machine readable, um, we now need to have software that can run run them. 
Um, so that's kind of where we got involved working with Google and, and WHO and some other kind of uh, technical partners to see if it would be possible to actually build applications that could consume uh, the guidelines, uh, which are basically fire um, questionnaires and things like that, and make these applications. So um, we started this process about two and a half years ago at the start of the pandemic. Um, and really with kind of Google's leadership, um, uh, you know, they started, they built an SDK on Android, which I'll go over in a second. And we uh, realized quite quickly that this was viable. And as an organization, we made the decision to basically commit to uh, re-architecting OpenSRP kind of from scratch to creating a new version of, of our of our platform uh, that is a global good. Um, and trying to see if we can do it to be based kind of natively on fire uh, so we can support the guidelines. So that's what we're calling OpenSRP Fire Core. So it's OpenSRP, it has all the lessons we've learned and it's, you know, the everything we've learned in de de developing digital health apps, but it's based on a new foundation uh, that's based on Google's SDK and uh, is built to natively support uh, the WHO smart guidelines. Um, so just a little bit on kind of fire and kind of the value too. So we, even before this, we, you know, we kind of were introduced to fire a couple years ago. And for anybody that kind of already doesn't know, but fire is sort of a, it's a standardized way uh, to, uh, it was designed initially to kind of exchange data. It's derived from, from HL7, which is an XML standard. And this is like the new version that's kind of based on JSON, which is a bit more user friendly. But in reality, it's what it really is, is just a shared data model that um, it's a way to, we all agree to represent a patient as a patient resource and a counter is, so it's it's a standardized way to represent um, health data and health processes. Uh, but more at a macro level, it's also provides us a really great architecture framework to think about health service delivery, which is I think really, really compelling. So, um, so, so FIRE provides us for the first time a, a, a agreed upon way um, to uh, represent uh, health architectures and build applications on top, which unlocks a tremendous amount of things. The other thing that's really key is it also provides a structured data model, but then you could also build your profiles where you um, would would link the data that you collect to specific medical terminologies like, you know, ICD-11 or SNOMED and other kinds of things. So you also can structure your data from a taxonomy standpoint that you can, that you can kind of really make sense of it and you know compare it across implementations um, using it so kind of that standardized data idea um, so kind of just in terms of core value what fire gives us when we're talking about building applications on top um, kind of the probably the first thing that i think that's most groups are going to really value is that fire supports this idea of structured data capture and structured data capture basically is uh, the ability to render uh, forms in FHIR. These are called questionnaires, but it's um, so it's kind of like X forms that we use in Comcare or in ODK or in OpenSRP, a lot of other tools. Um, so it's just a, a slightly different format, but it's part of the 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 FHIR spec. It's called a questionnaire. Um, and so one of the things, the first things that the Google's SDK did was they developed a um, a library that allows us to render um, questionnaires, so we can we can kind of create dynamic, uh, fully configurable forms of skip logic, et cetera, uh, to capture data. So that's like a super um, cool um, uh, kind of uh, thing of value. So right out of the box, we, we have sort of offline data collection with configurable forms. The other really powerful thing is uh, when you save a questionnaire in Fire, it out, it outputs um, a question or response, but then Fire also supports this idea of data extraction. And the idea here is what you don't want to do is you can you have your your forms like you maybe you're, represent your 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 clinical visit, but the idea is you want to then extract that out to the to right kind of corresponding resources. So if you register a patient, you'd have a, a patient registration form, but then that would then create a patient resource. Or if you're doing a medical visit like an encounter, you'd have an encounter. Um, You'd have a form that would generate an encounter, and then it would also create, you know, the corresponding observations. If you do a medication or a, a lab test or whatever you want to do, it, it would create all these corresponding uh, pieces. And what's really nice about that is if you're building health applications, you kind of know where to, to to go to find the information you want. You don't have to parse through all of your forms. 
So if I want to show, for example, uh, you know, blood pressure over time, I can just search through the observation table for that patient and then you know, plot out uh, that woman's apps there, her blood pressure, as an example. Um, so this allows us to build kind of really complex applications offline that supports like really robust kind of workflows. Um, really briefly, this is sort of what the, the Android SDK provides. So this is what we're building our applications on top. It's an Android library that allows us to basically access uh, fire resources that are stored in SQLite. It allows us to execute um, clinical logic. That's what we call the Smart Guidelines API. So that's the, 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 the questionnaires and the CQL that, that WHO is using to program their guidelines. Um, it does the data capture, and then it also just takes care of things like sync. So just a reliable sync is something, you know, you don't really want, ever wanna underestimate the value for. Uh, and then importantly, this this syncs to any Fire compatible um, server. So um, we're using an open source tool called Happy, um, but you could use, uh, you know, Google has the Health API, Microsoft Azure has one, Amazon has one. Um, so it works with any kind of compatible thing. So we're really decoupling the application from kind of the back end. I'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, in this new kind of world we're living in with Fire. And with FireCore, um, you know, this is the architecture we're looking at. So we have an Android app. So this is where OpenSRP FireCore is. Uh, we then just use any Fire server to store that data. So that's been huge for Ona because we we were able to sort of drop um, our old OpenSRP server and just focus on, on, on building the application because we can use the tool that another organization has been developing for, for 10 years that's commercially backed and has, you know, served billions and billions of records. Um, or we could work with Google and use their health API if we want to have HIPAA compliance. Um, so that's that's a huge win. It's also a huge win if you're thinking about like supporting a Ministry of Health, because the Ministry of Health can kind of focus on what's the what vendor do they want to use to provide their their hosting and their their servers around say fire. We don't really care too much like, if it's Microsoft or Google or a local vendor providing happy. We just want to make sure it's a fire server that we can kind of plug into. Um, so governments can make decisions on investing in things like what what kind of infrastructure we need. We, we know we're going to use fire, and they don't have to make a decision around what platform they're picking when they're when they're just they're deciding on those the software things. It also allows a great decoupling. Um, so um, you know we can we have analytics that's outside and something that we're developing with Google. Um, we're developing a separate uh, web application uh, that allows us to browse uh, a fire server to administer it. Uh, I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but it also really facilitates interoperability. So, um, so DHS2 has a fire adapter. So we've already used this to pull data out of our uh, fire instance. So we could register a patient in Android, uh, push it to fire, and then uh, use the DHS2 tracker adapter to ingest that and create records in DHS2 automatically. So we're so DHS2 is doing the work to manage that adapter. We really don't have to do too much except to do some initial kind of configurations uh, to set up that kind of workflow. So in terms of um, interoperability, you know, uh, going right to that shared data model that we all agree upon is hugely valuable. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things we did in, in sort of building this process is we realized that for fire to be kind of become useful we need to uh, have some some simple apps that we can hand to people to start building uh, on fire and, and start working on data collection so um, we worked at we're working on something called quest which is kind of like a, a, a com care odk or like a simple uh, case management tool on top of fire so the idea here is you can register a patient and then upload different questionnaires and collect data on that patient so it's just a very simple kind of data collection app. It's not really meant to be a full EMR, but a tool just to kind of get started with um, uh, on doing. And it's actually really powerful. You can use it for a lot of use cases. And we, we have, this is from the support of the, the McGovern Foundation that kind of helped kickstart this. So it's been really, really helpful. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that's kind of key about this is this idea of, of supporting the computable guidelines. So again, the idea here is is it's we're not just exporting the data in a, in a format that's fire we're actually bringing in all the logic so the questionnaires from from who in terms of what they want what the questions they want to ask when you're doing anc visit 
the logic. So how do you want to to um, interpret if that woman's at risk? The logic may be against past visits. So it may not be just from data from that one form. It may be like, I want to know how many past pregnancies she's had. So that'd be information that you have in the in the health system in her in her records that you have to look up. Um, so so the fire provides using something called clinical query language CQL um, and uh, ex fire expressions and questionnaires the ability to kind of do all this logic. So um, when we're saying a, a smart guideline compliant app, you're actually able to natively take that logic and with a little bit of not a lot of work, be able to quickly update your logic in the app. Um, and the really nice thing about that is if WHO releases a new guideline um, in the future, um, you know, you can you can we can do a quick update. A country can localize it, make sure they agree with it and then push it out over and then, you know, get that into to nurses hands with a bit of training a lot faster than you would might be doing if you had to kind of program this all. Um, so it's kind of, a, you know, a huge thing. So standardized logic, uh, reduce transcription errors, etc. <clears throat> um, so in terms of the logic, I think it's also kind of um, important to look at kind of what this is really going to enable. And this is, I think, really where it starts to get exciting, right? Um, so uh, so WHO is actually taking on a lot of the, the work that we would typically have to do uh, and that they're, program they're providing the initial kind of programming, the first pass on the, these modules. So, so WHO has already developed, and they call them WHO Digital Accelerator or Kits, so DACs. Um, some smart guidelines for child immunization uh, at ANC, family planning and child emergency health. So um, so these have to still be kind of built into apps in the L4s, um, but these exist. Um, so um, so in theory, like, you know, our goal uh, as ONA is we want to have, in, you know, by sometime early next year, uh, the ability to, to go to Ministry of Health and say, <clears throat> we have a facility app that can run you know, immunization, ANC, family planning, you know, and that's that's going to be really, really compelling because I don't really know of too many apps that can do the full sort of clinical things. Uh, then we could add in the future, you know, OPD, labor delivery, HIV, TB, CMAM, um, you know, obstetrics, all these other things <clears throat> that are a lot really complex to add. Um, and, that, and that's the value the idea you could have a full clinic on a tablet um, web or or mobile app is i think just super super compelling and that's a huge unlock um you know I, we're, I don't think we're seeing a lot of that today because it's it's a lot of work to do um on the community side um we've we've developed a kind of a chw module we're doing this for liberia right now um so we're, we're it's going to have a household immunization for child child health anc pnc family planning malaria um, we're also working at village reach to develop a supply chain module and all that. Um, but in the future, we'd also like, you know, talking to, to UNICEF about maybe a CRVS module, um, you know, reveal, which is our kind of malaria kind of precision health work, etc. Um, so um, if you think about the, the app as sort of like a player, a VM player, and you're just building and you're putting in your own logic on top of it with these modules, it's really kind of where <clears throat> this gets exciting. And it's all working on a shared data model. Um, the other bit that's, I think, really key with FHIR is this idea of care coordination. Um, so with FHIR, you know, we, we can see, we have a shared data model, so it allows us to, um, you know, see what's happening, you know, follow the patient from, from the community where they might be registered to the clinic up to the facility and even involve the patient in their care um, by having access to that shared common data model across the different applications. Um, FHIR also supports some native things like tasking, referrals, appointments. Um, these are all kind of like first class objects in FHIR that um, if you want to do, for example, integration, say, between ComCare and OpenMRS right now for a referral, you, you would probably have to come up with your own strategy to do that. Uh, but if you're using uh, FHIR, you could use a task or referral to do that. So it's kind of a standardized uh, way to do that in the FHIR approach. Uh, and that's kind of really compelling. So just a quick example of what that looks like, you know, in a world where you want to do child immunization, you know, you'd have your facility app where you're registering kids, you're doing the immunizations, you're doing growth monitoring, sick child triage and kind of referral. Um, but at the community side, you could also register the same kids, you know, but also add their location to where they live, refer them if they're sick, 
check their immunization cards, refer them if, if they're missing a vaccine, do you record births and deaths, you know, check for birth certificates, child health. So, um, but they're all, but then both of these applications, even though they're different, their UIs are different, they're designed for a different health worker, are working from this the same back end, the same data with a shared data model. Um, so you really can start to, I think we really need to stop thinking about just rolling out a CHW app or a community a facility app. We need to be thinking of these as holistic systems. Um, because in 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 health, like without the digital, the the community and the facility work together. We need to do the same thing with in digital. So I think fire really um, you can do this obviously without fire, but I think fire um, really facilitates this in a really, really kind of positive way. Um, so that's kind of like you know how I think this applies towards you know immunization. <clears throat> um, the other thing that's really exciting is around standardized data enables kind of us to look at kind of AI in the future. Um, if you look at health analytics right now, they're quite simple. Like it's really about you know you know how many visits by a health worker, how many kids are missing a vaccine, you know you know things like that. Um, and the only time you start to really see innovative analytics is more in a research study where you have like a lot a lot of data for like one specific place of the research team. And the, the primary reason is that the data is so um, heterogeneous, um, you know, between uh, sites, like the data model is different, you know, a researcher, you know, doesn't really know how to interpret like another apps, you know, kind of data, even if they're both on AMC as an example. So with FIRE, and if you adopt the, the smart guidelines, um, the idea is that you could have an application in Zambia for ANC, one in Rwanda, one in Vietnam, and um, you could in theory start to develop a AI, AI model for maybe risk identification in, in pregnant women uh, that would work across all those three countries since you're working on kind of uh, a very standardized data output. And I, I just, I think that's massive. I, I, we, it's gonna be such an unlock for um, specialization and allow kind of the, the really smart people in the world that can do that kind of work uh, to do that work because we'll give them data for the first time. And then more importantly, we can operationalize that at scale. Um, so, so, so this foundations we're talking about now, it's it's great for configurability and all that, but what's really exciting is the, the things that we can't do now that this is gonna unlock. Um, the other thing that's really, really valuable though in the short term is that FIRE as a standard promotes specialization, which allows us to start to create software ecosystems. So what I mean by that is as we've been trying to build out our, our new platform, like I already mentioned, we were able to dump our back end. So that, that alone helped with our decision because we know we didn't have to, to also rewrite a servers. I don't know if we could have done that. Um, but we also came across, uh, just a, a quick preview, um, this tool by the Norwegian Health Institute. And this is a, a, a UI, a GUI for um, authoring um, fire questionnaires. Um, so here, you know, you can you can you could have your, your questions. You can you can add these. You can just see you can do skip logic. So this question shows up when there's tenor swelling behind the ear equals no. Um, so this this allows you to author in a in a, a non-programmer way um, questionnaires. It allows you to preview them um, and even use this. You know, you can adapt this for kind of data collection. Um, so so this kind of ability to have a standardized way to represent logic, clinical logic in a form, uh, and then, you know, use that to download to your, your Android app it is super powerful. But this would have taken us, you know, I don't, over a year to build, and I don't know if we would have done as good of a job, to be honest. They did, they've done a superb job, and they continue to manage us. So, so that's like, it adds so much value. And, and now, like, they didn't, we never met them. Anybody in the world now, it's kind of the ODK ecosystem, can use this tool if you're using fire questionnaires and benefit from it. Um, so, you know, correspondingly, Ona has been uh, contributing something called FireWeb. You know, we're using it for OpenSRP, but it could be used for any other Fire app. Um, and this allows you to manage your, your providers, uh, manage locations, do team assignment, view patient data. Um, you know, we're working on data entry through it, et cetera. So I'm not going to show that today, but, you know, this is another kind of important piece you need if you're building digital health apps. You need that web interface to manage your your your, your deployment um, so what ona has been doing is we on top of the sdk we're developing something called firecore this is sort of the the application that sits on top that provides you a ui 
Um, so we built a configurable system that is we store all the, the configurations in Fire, which is really cool. So you can actually update your app by just syncing uh, to your Fire server. Um, and this allows us to build our, our, our register views, our patient profiles. Uh, we've added some functionality like peer-to-peer -peer sync, uh, a geo widget, um, you know, all these other kinds of things. Um, so it's kind of that application layer on top of what Google provides on top of their SDK. We've used that. Um, our first kind of app we built in the very beginning was with WHO. We developed a, a, a COVID-19 application that allows you to record patients, register patients, record their vaccines. Uh, and then we worked with WHO to, um, um, this is to actually generate a, a DD, like a digital vaccine certificate. Um, so that's kind of like what that looks like. Um, so it's kind of a first example of outputting all the, the necessary fire resources that WHO was able to take, ingest, and then generate these fire resources. They did that work with, with PATH. Um, um, and then this is kind of what we're, we're working towards in Liberia. So it's the first generation is more of just a standard application, but we're going to be working towards like a, a task-based approach for doing kind of community health work, you know, with a, with a mapping component, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I'll give you a quick demo of where we're at with that in, in a minute. Um, and then kind of the last two points. So um, so I showed you sort of the, the technical advantages and kind of why we're so excited by it. Um, but we also think that it's fundamentally important for this idea of local ownership. Like, you know, as we're countries are getting more serious about scaling and, and developing, you know, and really investing in digital health, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, importance, which is really, I think, key by ministries of health and by donors to ensure that there's local ownership. They don't want it just to be a, um, a cabal of a couple external, you know, vendors like ONA and the others uh, just providing the, the software uh, and, you know, locking out the, the local implementers. Um, and with FIRE, I think it's kind of key. There's a couple of things, right? So one is um, it uh, it allows us to reframe the discussion we were having with the Ministry of Health when they're when they're trying to decide what platform to pick to scale. Um, they still ultimately have to pick a platform, but you can start the discussion more around why don't you focus on picking your data model and your architecture? And you know, I don't think there's gonna be a lot of debate that that'll be fire. So so focus on investing in your your data model, you know, your profiles. That's kind of what in, in fire speak what you do is you develop sort of like. These are the, 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 the information we want to use to register a patient. These are all the key questions we have for a patient that all digital health apps should use. So, and so in FIRE, that's called a, a profile. So invest in developing those. And then, I, then you can start to layer in and, and pick applications that can integrate with FIRE, whether they're FIRE native or to support interoperability with it and build in on top of that. Um, so, um, so really, you can start investing in that building capacity around fire, and you know, building your trainings around you know configuring, learning the logic of that, and not how to configure specific apps, whether it's OpenSRP or DHS2 or CompCare or whatever it is. Um, and if you're not happy with a platform or vendor, you can take your logic and move it to another app. The other thing that's really key, like I mentioned, is it also lowers the barrier to software entry for local partners. So. You know, like what we have, I'm showing you today is open source, so any you know anybody can use that. But if if a if a local company says, you know, we don't want to do that, we want to build something from scratch, um, you know, Google's SDK would allow you to kind of we, what I what I'm showing you, we we did in less than a year uh, as we helped Google build this SDK, which is still being developed. So, you know, in the future, I think you know uh, a software developer could in six months to a year, you know, build viable apps that they could then use in their country um, to really have benefit because they're not worrying about the hard technical problems like building a, a form, data capture library, et cetera. Um, so that's, I just want to emphasize, I really feel that, that FIRE is going to really unlock local ownership, which is becoming increased priority. Um, yeah. Uh, and then, um, yeah, and then I'm, I, I might come back to that. Let me just, let me just stop and just show you quickly the, the, because I'll come back to this because there is a GIS piece, but let me just share my just switch over quick and just share my emulator. Oops. Can can you guys see my screen? All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So this is just a, a quick preview of of 
to show you that it's it's you know this exists. It's still a work in progress, but um, so this is a, a fire uh, you know fire core app um, that is um, what we're going to be based on what we're going to be rolling out in Liberia later this fall. Um, so for CHWs, you have this idea of, of households, and you have different types of of you know clients. You have like ANC, so this would be like pregnant women, um, but um, so I, I, I can just show you, for example, like a, a family. So we have like the Bush family. Um, and so you have different household members. Um, you could have tasks that are linked to the household or you could have um, tasks based on these things. So what I'm going to do quickly is let me just. Um, I'm just going to register a, uh, a household member quick. Um, so let's just say Jenna Bush. Um, I don't know why I'm picking the Bush family, but um, all right. So pick her date of birth, 1996, female, um, no. So these are, again, this is all configurable using a fire questionnaire, like I, I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, no education level primary. Um, I'm going to save it. Um, so now if I go to uh, Jenna or go back to the Bushes, you see that we now have Jenna. She's a 26 year old woman, uh, a female. Um, and then I can go to her profile and I can just see basic information. This is going to be filled out more in the future. So if I want to enroll her in ANC, um, so if she's pregnant, I would just record her ANC form. Um, I'm going to say it's an active case. Um, did I already confirm to the facility? No, it hasn't been confirmed. Yes, she's referred. I'm going to pick her last menstrual period. So let's say it's a month ago. Um, and in the future, this will auto calculate the months pregnant. But you can see it does expect a date of delivery. Uh, let's say she does have danger signs. What are the danger signs? Say, it's say, you know, fever and a chill. Uh, no. OK. And does she, you know, does she have a birth plan? So let's just say no for now. Um, so I'm going to submit that. Um, and now the really cool thing is um, we've what we've done is fire has this idea of care plans. Uh, so care plan is basically the logic that you use um, when you want to enroll somebody for a certain type of care. So for ANC, you have a what we call a plan definition. And the plan is basically what you do, the care you need to provide to a woman when she's pregnant. And then that generates an individual care plan for each patient. And that care, care plan consists of different tasks that you then follow. So, so Jenna now in behind the scenes has a care plan for her pregnancy. It has like a, you know, when it started, when it, when, when her expected date of delivery is. Um, so we kind of know when it should, when the child should show up if everything goes well. Uh, but then also it start it automatically creates for you based on this, the schedule that you define in your plan, um, her, her ANC visit schedule. So now I have these ANC visits. And if I just do a really quick one, um, no, no, uh, no, yes. So, so again, this is not a clinical ANC. This is a CHW ANC visit. So it's very, very simple. It's really about screening for risk and you know encouraging them to have like a birth plan um, and say that. So if I do that and I hit save, uh, and now if I go back, there's a little bit of a, a lag here. Um, if I go back to Jenna, I'll see now that her task has been complete. Okay. Um, so it's just like a, a, just a very quick kind of example of this kind of pattern where you enroll them, you roll them in care plan, and then you can assign them to tasks. And the really cool thing is these tasks can then be assigned to other health workers. Um, it can be assigned to like, you know, can be seen by a nurse at the facility, et cetera. Um, and now Jess is available or Jen is available in the system. And if we had a corresponding facility app for ANC, you know, we would already know sort of the reported uh, you know, we'd have her information already in the system. We'd have her, uh, her reported, uh, you know, LMP, et cetera, that the nurse would then verify. Um, so that's just a, you know, a quick thing. And then also just little details like um, uh, device device sync, language support. Um, the other quick one that that's kind of really cool is we support in-app reporting. Um, and uh, this first one, when I first time I run, it's a little slow, so so bear with me, but it's, What's exciting about this is this is also purely based on fire. Fire has something called measure reports, which are a way to 
um, generate um, defined indicators. Uh, and then, so this is actually using uh, the, the, the fire way for defining your population and then ways to disaggregate it to create indicators. Um, so what's what's really cool about, if you think about the smart guidelines is you can, you can develop your data collection app, but you also can design your reporting that you would want your app to do too as a holistic package. So, so not only can we support data collection, we could also support the kind of reporting that you would want a health worker to see as defined by the SMART guidelines. Uh, and this was this is work from support from Digital Square and PATH. Um, a lot of patience because it took forever for all the for all the necessary fire things to happen to make this possible. But it's really exciting to see that we we can kind of do that. Um, so one one last thing, and I just want to since this is a talk about GIS, I just want to circle back um, really quickly on. On, on fire. Um, so, um, so the next thing that we're, you know, we've done a lot of work in the past on developing applications for malaria. It's called Reveal. That allows us to, um, you know, uh, identify where people live. Um, we did this with Akros in, in Zambia, identify where people live, um, register households, and then assign tasks to those structures. So it could be like a uh, uh, it could be a thing like, you know, I want to visit a house and and, and spray it, or I, I know how many people live in that house. So I want to bring a bed out for every 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 sleeping set in that house. Um, so what we're really excited by with the with the work we're doing in fire now is since it's based on a task based data model, um, you know, the idea what we can do now is we can take smart guidelines so we can take, you know, WHO prescribed, you know, malaria treatment at the household level or some kind of a screening. Um, combine that with the geo widget and then start to do precision based care, whether it's in campaigns or routine service delivery. Um, taking the, the standard of fire model too, we could also think about how can we start to look at um, doing kind of large scale um, campaign work um, based on fire. So fire provides all the ingredients we need for that. It provides the ability to define a micro plan using a plan definition. It has this idea of health workers, which are your field data collectors. It has the idea of teams, which is how you, if your field teams for doing like a large scale, you know, a COVID vaccine drive. Uh, it has tasks, so you can you can say visit a, a community or visit a household. Um, so we can link data collection to specific locations and tasks. And we have locations which are like a shared way for us to understand where people live or where facilities are, etc. So, you know, like just the idea that we we, we we register where Grace is and now everybody in the system knows that and can link service deliveries and tasks to that, whether it's a vaccine person, an antenatal nurse, um, a bed net distributor is like really, really, I think kind of a compelling idea in general. So we need to start thinking more holistically too when we're designing health systems about shared data that these different apps should use. So like we should have shared locations, you know, I hope someday in the future down to the household level if that's if that's appropriate from like a data privacy standpoint. Um, it also allows us to kind of start to think about decoupling of micro planning strategies, right? So if we're using kind of a fire approach, we can create tools that that you know really beautiful you know visual tools using maps on the web to do your planning that links to your spreadsheets, you're generating your your campaigns. Um, you could have different tools, whether it's reveal or or OpenSRP or DHS2, if they sort of agree on a way to, to download tasks and locations, you know, they can then, you know, um, take a plan from another tool and collect data on it. You can have specialized analytics from the different tools, and then, of course, you can have that data feed into DHS2. Um, so this is something that we're kind of, we're, we're trying to push. Rocco, I'm going to we'll keep pushing you <laughs> a little bit. We can talk about that. Maybe on the call, but um, so that's, I think that's kind of the idea. If once you start to embrace fire, we can then start to focus on these other areas like micro planning that might be kind of the secondary level, but the same ideas and values really apply. And I think you can take this for a lot of other ways in health. Um, and with fire, you know, if you think about um, you know uh, a campaign, if you're doing a, a, a community visit or a household visit to do a bed net distribution or spray. The same idea applies for every single other kind of visit you're doing. So, you know, we also think it's really about routine care. How does a health system adapt 
to the service delivery of a patient, you know, um, stuff like that. So I, I think I've gone a bit over, so I'm going to stop and I'd like to hand it over to questions and sorry for going a little bit long. Um, thanks.